Hey everyone, so we just are getting started. So we're just gonna wait about a minute or so, so just so everybody can filter in and then uh, we'll get started. All right, so it looks like everybody's people, or most people have started to filter in by now. So it's 1 p.m., we're gonna get started. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, this event is being recorded. Your cameras and audio are off and will remain off for the event. Um, we encourage you to write questions in the Q&A section and we will take uh, time to answer as many as possible at the end. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment for land acknowledgement. Um, we recognize that many of us are joining from different places in Canada today, we, and we will not be able to acknowledge all Indigenous lands our participants are living on. That being said, I would like to acknowledge that CCLA's office and the speakers for this event are in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnanabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the land Indigenous peoples have lived on and taken care of since time immemorial. We are honored to be able to live and work on this land. With that, I will pass it over to our Executive Director and General Counsel, Noah, for a quick introduction about our work. So, Noah. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we are so happy to have so many people here interested in listening to, participating, helping us fight for equality rights and freedoms in Canada. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for the work you do supporting CCLA and supporting those equality and other rights across Canada. It's so important. Before you get to hear from our main speaker, I want to share with you some key highlights of things that are happening at CCLA, issues, rights violations, and other important updates. I wanna start by sharing that this is our 60th anniversary CCLA was founded in 1964, long before the Charter. We have been fighting all this time for rights, freedoms, justice, and equality for all people in Canada. And although we have had some victories, and although things have changed, laws have changed, our tactics have changed, and in 1982, we had the uh, enactment of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there is still so much to do. We have to keep pressing forward and our work as an independent watchdog organization for the protection and advancement of rights and freedoms of all people in Canada remains crucially necessary as you're going to hear from this presentation and from these updates. Uh, I also wanted to share with you that we have a new Fundamental Freedoms Director, Anaïs Broussier McNichol, who will be working closely with our incoming new privacy surveillance and digital rights manager. Anais is a brilliant lawyer with extraordinary experience and I very much look forward to introducing you to her. We'll do a webinar briefing with her later on this year. The other, uh, in, in terms of the work that we're doing, the education work that we're doing remains consistently active and robust. We are in classrooms across Ontario and indeed in Canada. We are doing our work with students, teachers in training, communities, marginalized communities, newcomers in English, in French. Uh, our outreach is tremendous and we have a uh, national presence thanks to some very wonderful support. The focus of our education work is on critical thinking and overcoming the echo chambers that have become so common in people's lives. One of the big projects that we're going to tell you about, and we'll, we'll be doing an education briefing as well later on, hopefully this year, uh, is a series of videos that we have we are about to launch explaining key charter rights to the public. And we're going to be translating that into several different languages so that it's accessible to newcomers. In our advocacy work, there is far too much for me to be able to share it all with you. And I want to make sure that you have time to hear from Harini. But I do want to share some of the key things that have happened this last few months. In March of 2023, we had a legal victory in the Ontario Court of Appeal in what's known as the Working Families case. 
It had to do with a law restricting the ability of organizations to speak up about different issues that may affect elections. And the court agreed with us that, these, that this new elections law that limited people's expression unreasonably infringed Ontarians' right to vote. This case has been appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. In another uh, big legal victory, as you know, CCLA challenged the government using emergency powers in a situation that needed law enforcement but didn't need emergency powers to address. That happened in early 2022. And uh, just in February of this year, we received our decision from the federal court who agreed that the use of the Emergencies Act was not the appropriate way to handle and dismantle the blockades in Ottawa. Uh, blockades that had caused terrible harm to marginalized communities but and were beyond reasonable but didn't need emergency powers which create other problems in a democratic society that needs checks and balances. The government is appealing that decision, but we have an we expression in particular with the online harms bill that also violates uh, this is Bill C-63 that also violates people's right to privacy, their digital rights. We have an important de democratic rights case around the disenfranchisement of constituents when a majority government uh, effectively silences their representative. And we have intervened to discuss what democracy needs. We are active still on the privacy front. We're monitoring two key privacy uh, related laws, uh, bills that came into being earlier in the fall. We've made submissions on C26 on cybersecurity and C27 on privacy in the private sector. Uh, C27 is a law that includes, it's an omnibus bill that includes uh, an entire section on artificial intelligence we had very significant concerns with ADA, the Artificial Intelligence Data Act, uh, and we're continuing to raise our voice and work to make amendments so that people in Canada are adequately protected, their privacy is protected. We had um, another win. The work of civil liberties is not always easy and we don't always succeed with every case, but we have had a number of really critical victories in this last while. We intervened in a case called Bikovitz which had to do with the use of IP addresses and whether police needed a warrant in order to obtain from third parties um, the IP addresses. And the court agreed with us, the Supreme Court of Canada, and moving forward, police will be required to seek a warrant to access IP addresses. CCLA has been at the forefront of helping the court in the public interest understand privacy and emerging technologies and how these come together. We participated in a coroner's inquest into the death of a vulnerable woman with mental illness who died behind bars in jail. We provided a number of evidence-based recommendations and the jury adopted many of those as their own as a result of the inquest. Um, final, final update that I'll provide here, but of course our website is full of so much more information and our newsletters uh, is a case called CBC. Uh, a case that was conducted, C CBC versus the King. It was a case that was conducted entirely in secret before the lower court. And CCLA intervened at the Supreme Court to talk about the importance of the open courts principle and that secret trials are not a safe or secure uh, situation in a free and democratic society like Canada, where we need checks and balances, proper accountability by government institutions, as well as our own role as an independent watchdog. So those are some of the key things that we're working on. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to our main speaker. I haven't touched on the topics that she's working on, but you'll see that in the really brief period that, C that Harini has been with CCLA, she's been with us just a year, not quite a year. She has done the most tremendous work and we are thrilled to have her. Harini Sivalingam, our, the director of CCLA's equality program, coordinates advocacy strategies, for marginalized individuals and groups whose right to full equality has not been realized. Her work includes monitoring significant equality issues and egregious violations across Canada, strategizing on litigation interventions, public outreach, education, 
and engagement with policymakers, with communities on issues concerning equality. Harney was called to the bar in Ontario in 2006. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto. She has law degrees from Osgoode Hall and from McGill University, and is in the process of completing a PhD at York University. She is also an adjunct instructor in the Graduate Diploma in Immigration and Citizenship Law at Queen's University, teaching courses on the foundations of Canadian immigration law and refugee protection law. Harney has advocated for low-income communities as a law student and lawyer, working in community legal aid clinics, focused, focusing on advancing access to justice in a whole range of areas, workers' rights, tenants' rights, advocating for social assistance and ODSP recipients, newcomer and refugee communities, and as you will hear so much more since coming to CCLA, we are extraordinarily lucky to have somebody as dedicated and passionate to equality rights as Harney, and I'm now happy to turn it over to her. Thank you, Noah, for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and it's so lovely to have you all join us this afternoon. As Noah mentioned, my name is Harini Sivalingam. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the director of the Equality Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. For anyone who is visually impaired, I will now describe my appearance and background. I am a medium brown-skinned woman with shoulder-length curly black hair. I am wearing a dark gray blazer with a black collarless shirt underneath. I am sitting at my desk in my home office, and my background has some frame degrees in the background. So welcome and thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon to hear about the work we are doing in the Equality Program at CCLA. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to not only provide you with a brief update on some key cases in the Equality Program, but to also thank you for your interest and support um, for, and for supporting the important work we do around promoting and protecting the fundamental rights and freedoms of all of us in Canada through the courts, legislatures, and through public engagement. For those of you who are new to CCLA or the Equality Program, I will start with a brief overview of what work the Equality Program does. The Equality Program is concerned with the promotion and protection of the rights of individuals and groups who face discrimination, whose rights to full equality has not been realized, in particular, those who are most marginalized and vulnerable in our society. And we recognize that for human rights and fundamental freedoms to have any real meaning, they must be equally accessible to every person. So when I speak of equality, I am referring to equality in its most expansive and inclusive sense that includes the concept of equity. So this means that in order to achieve substantive equality in its most expansive and truest sense, that we need to take into account structural, institutionalized, historical, and current systems, including legal and political ones, that contribute to marginalizing and, and disadvantaging particular groups. As you know, equity-seeking groups are often the prime targets of those who seek to undermine human and civil rights and fundamental freedoms. Often, these are the most vulnerable and marginalized individuals and groups in our society, such as Indigenous peoples, Black and racialized communities, 2S LGBTQIA plus communities, people with disabilities, including people living with mental health illness, immigrant, refugee, and newcomer communities, and those who are living in poverty, just to name a few. In addition, people who have intersectional identities, that means those who belong to more than one of these groups, face additional challenges and barriers towards achieving equality. And oftentimes, our legal and political systems and the laws and policies that sustain these institutions don't adequately take into account the implications of these various identities and their intersections on the everyday lived experiences of people. In CCLA's work advocating in the courts and legislatures, we seek to highlight these gaps in the laws and policies and in the Equality Program in particular, we aim to shed light on how such laws and policies particularly impact marginalized and vulnerable people 
um, and in particular, those with intersecting identities. As Noah mentioned, CCLA is marking its 60th year of champion for rights and freedoms across Canada. That means that we predate, as Noah mentioned, and are older than the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So while the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is an important legal advocacy tool, it is not our only tool. And while many of the cases that I will be discussing today involve our work in the courts, the work we do also goes beyond just charter and court litigation. We've been doing this work of advancing equality for over 60 years and have had many successes and advancements over the course of these six decades, as Noah mentioned in her opening remarks. However, as you will see from my update and some of the cases that we're working on in the equality program, there is still so much more work that needs to be done to advance equality for all. So there are many important and pressing equality issues that we are currently working on in the equality program. So in this session, over the, um, the next few minutes that we have together, I will share what CCLA is doing to advance the rights of vulnerable and marginalized communities and why it's important that we are involved in these cases. Since I last provided an equality update in October, there have been some significant developments in many key cases in the equality program that I will be dis that I discuss there and that I'm going to expand on in today's session. So this afternoon, I'll be focusing on a couple of these cases that CCLA has taken a leadership role in advancing legal challenges in the courts and provide you with some important updates. First, I will provide an update on our legal challenge against Bill 21 in Quebec. Um, next, I will provide an update on our challenge to revisions of policy 713 or 713 in New Brunswick that impact the rights of trans and gender diverse students. Uh, finally, I will share with you an update on our intervention in a legal challenge of municipal bylaws that enable evictions of encampment residents in in Kingston, Ontario. So I will begin with the overview of the work that we are doing in each of these cases, and then we will open up the floor for questions and discussions. So first, I would like to share a significant update on our legal challenge um, to Bill 21. Since I last provided an update, there has been a significant develop development in the constitutional challenge to Bill 21. As you may already know, Bill 21 was passed in 2019 by the Quebec government and prohibits certain public sector employees from wearing religious symbols. Not, the notwithstanding clause was invoked in an attempt to override important charter guarantees such as religious freedoms and equality rights. CCLA, along with the National Council for Canadian Muslims and an affected individual who at the time um, of this challenge in 2019 was a teacher candidate, launched a constitutional challenge to Bill 21. So as you may have heard from recent CCLA communications and the media, unfortunately, the Quebec Court of Appeal rendered its decision last month on an appeal of the lower court decision. And this was a painfully disappointing decision that failed to acknowledge the harms caused by Bill 21 to religious minorities in Quebec, in particular to Muslim Sikh and Jewish communities in the province. The Court of Appeal dismissed CCLA's two main arguments that we brought forward to ensure that the court is able to hear substantive arguments on the constitutional issues raised in light of the use of the notwithstanding clause. So we argued um, in, in, in our Court of Appeal challenge that the invocation of the notwithstanding clause does not shield Bill 21 from any constitutional scrutiny by the court. In fact, it's an important constitutional principle that there are a number of checks and balances between different branches of the state, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. So the first argument that we raised to the court was that Bill 21 violates the architecture or the structure of the Constitution by limiting participation in public institutions. So what we argued here is that the principles of democracy and respect for minority rights extend beyond the rights guaranteed by the Charter because they are part of the very structure and fabric of the Canadian Constitution. 
So there are unwritten rules in the Constitution that must be protected, such as participation in public institutions, which is one of the pillars of our democratic and inclusive society. A second argument that we put forward to the court is that Bill 21 is ultra virus or beyond the jurisdiction of the province. So we argue that Bill 21 goes beyond the scope of the provincial government to enact. I won't bore you with too many of the technical details, but our key argument here was the province was attempting to regulate morality or fundamental social values, and that Bill 21 imposed prohibitive provisions that punish with penalties, which is recognized as an objective of the criminal law, which is a federal jurisdiction. And it is the federal parliament, not the provincial leg legislature, that ultimately has what's called residual jurisdiction over these divisions of powers, if there's um, conflict between provincial and federal jurisdiction of powers. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeal decision also undid some of the victories that were obtained in the previous lower court, which struck down certain parts of the law as uh, Bill 21 as unconstitutional. Specifically, the lower court had found that Bill 21 could not apply to English language school boards due to the constitutional protection to minority language rights in education under Section 23 of the Charter. The Court of Appeal, however, reversed this ruling and failed to recognize the inordinate harms done to individuals who wear religious symbols, who want to engage in the profession of teaching, whose options are limited by Bill 21. The small sliver of the silver lining in the ruling is that thankfully the Court of Appeal agreed with the lower court decision that Bill 21 violates democratic rights and kept intact that it should be inapplicable to members of the National Assembly itself. So this recent decision by the Court of Appeal is a blow to rights and freedoms of Quebecers and a setback for equality, justice, and freedom in Canada. It is also important to note that this has been almost five years since Bill 21 was first passed in June 2019. This means that it's been almost five years that the discriminatory legislation has been harming religious minority communities in Quebec. Last month in February, the Quebec government introduced legislation that reenacts these harmful provisions of Bill 21, since the notwithstanding clause has called what, um, what's called a sunset clause that requires legislatures to reenact legislation that invokes the notwithstanding clause after five years. Bill 21 is a discriminatory piece of legislation that negatively impacts individuals based on their religious beliefs, and it is clear that this legislation has a disproportionate impact on specific religious minority groups, such as Muslim, Sikh, and Jewish communities. Since Bill 21 came into force, religious minorities have faced increased marginalization and exclusion in Quebec. Unfortunately, the discriminatory impact of Bill 21 on the rights and freedom of a wide range of public sector employees will continue to have harmful impact until the bill is deemed unconstitutional in its entirety. That is why CCLA, along with our litigation partners in this case, will continue to fight against Bill 21. We are committed to pursuing all necessary legal avenues of available, including seeking leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. After carefully reviewing the decision, um, in collaboration with our counsel, we are in the process of exploring the best legal arguments to advance in a potential appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada in order to take this challenge of Bill 21 to the highest court in Canada. So next, I will provide an update on how CCLA is combating the eroding protections for trans rights across the country. Another key issue that CCLA has been advocating on this year is combating the erosion of rights and freedom for transgender peoples and communities in Canada. For those of you who might not be familiar with transgendered issues, transgendered individuals identify with a gender identity that is different from their biological sex. As you have probably seen, there has been a rise in anti-trans sentiment across Canada and globally. Anti-rights movements have targeted transgender and gender diverse populations. 
In October, I provided you with an update on litigation that CCLA launched in British Columbia, I'm uh, sorry, British New, sorry, <laughs> that CCLA launched in New Brunswick to challenge revisions to policy 713 that rolled back protections for trans and gender diverse students in New Brunswick public schools. The original policy 7 was introduced in 2020 after extensive consultations with stakeholders, teachers, parents, students, and community members in order to create minimum standards and protections for 2S LGBTQIA plus students. The intent of that policy was to create a safe, inclusive, supportive learning environment for all students in school, and especially to 2S LGBTQIA plus students. And similar policies exist in many other jurisdictions across the country. However, in June of this year, the Minister of Education in New Brunswick unilaterally unveiled revisions to Policy 713 that eroded these standards and weakened the protection that specifically targeted trans and gender diverse students. And these revisions were made without any consultation with school communities, parents, students, or affected communities. There were many advocates um, who came out in, um, uh, with strong critiques of these policy changes, including the child and youth advocate in New Brunswick. And the Minister of, of, of Education um, ignored these recommendations and critiques and made further revisions to the policy in late August that reinforced the harms and discriminatory nature of the policy. The revised Policy 713 restricts students under the age of 16 from using their chosen names and pronouns in schools. These policy revisions have drawn condemnation from both its process and substance. So the rollback of, in of inclusive education guidelines in Policy 713 threatens the safety and well-being of 2S LGBTQIA plus students and increases the risk of facing discrimination and violence. The sad reality is that for some trans and gender diverse children um, and youth, schools may be the only safe space that they have to express their gender identity. Being involved in this issue is important for CCLA to stand up for trans and gender diverse kids. Since June, the CCLA has been closely monitoring the developments in New Brunswick um, and has been re regularly meeting with local community groups involved in advocacy on this issue. In September, um, CCLA launched a legal challenge of Policy 713 um, and I'm happy to report that in December, CCLA was granted public interest standing in order to pursue this litigation. Next month in April, the court will hear from nine interveners that want to advance legal arguments in this challenge. New Brunswick is not the only province to introduce anti-trans policies. CCLA is also intervening in the legal challenge of a similar policy in Saskatchewan. In that province, the court has granted an injunction that temporarily suspends the policy until the court determined the constitutional validity of the policy. However, just like the Quebec government did with Bill 21, the Saskatchewan government introduced legislation to implement these anti-trans school policies with the notwithstanding clause overriding Section 2, um, which is fundamental freedom, section seven, which is the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and section 15, which is equality rights of the charter. In Saskatchewan, the public interest litigants, UR Pride, was successful in being able to add this new legislation to their claim, along with an additional section 12 argument um, that the challenge, um, aside to the challenge, that the action of the state constitutes cruel and unusual treatment uh, towards trans and gender diverse students. And the government was unsuccessful in trying to get this case thrown out. Following in the heels of Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, in February, as you may have heard in through media accounts, Alberta announced proposed policies that egregiously infringe rights and freedoms of trans people. Alberta's policy unveiled sweeping changes that target a wide range of sectors, including healthcare, education, and sports. The government has stated, um, the government in Alberta has stated that it intends to introduce this legislation in the fall. 
CCLA, along with advocates um, and um, experts from medical and education communities, have spoken out against Alberta's policies because the fight against anti-trans policies in Canada is at its core a fight for freedom and rights. It is a battle in support of the freedom to express one's identity, to make decisions about one's um, bodily autonomy, and to pursue education and healthcare options without discrimination. CCLA is committed to um, demand that government's um, education policies and healthcare policies respect the rights of trans and gender diverse people in New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and across Canada. So next I will uh, provide a update on um, our work in challenging encampment um, evictions of vulnerable unhoused people. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit and now talk about another important equality issue that CCLA is concerned about that has been advancing in a different way. So the previous cases, um, Bill 21 and the challenge to policy 713 in New Brunswick are ones that CCLA has taken on as major cases and we are taking the lead in advancing through the courts as the main party to the challenges. This next case that I'm going to provide an update, CCLA is taking the role of an intervener. So this is an important role that helps advance the legal issues that main parties to the case do not have sufficient time to address in their own arguments. Interveners play an essential role in public interest litigation by helping the courts with legal principles that should be considered. So for example, in the racial profiling case in Montreal, um, CCLA is a party intervener, which means that we have a larger role than traditional friends of the court interveners and are able to put forward evidence and cross-examine witnesses. Um, so this case, we're not a party intervener, we're a friend of the court intervener, and CCLA recently intervened in an important challenge of a municipal bylaw that prohibits encampment residents, um, uh, sorry, that, that prohibits encampments um, and restricts its residents from erecting encampments and enables the city to evict encampment residents from, from these sites in Kingston. The challenge was launched by the Kingston Community Legal Clinic, who approached CCLA over the summer to intervene in the case. In the spring of last year, the city of Kingston made an application to evict encampment residents at Bell Park and residents of the encampment challenged this eviction with the help of um, the Kingston Community Legal Clinic. In October, a hearing was held to determine if the city's application to enforce the evictions was constitutional. The applicants um, and pro bono counsel representing CCLA appeared before the Ontario Superior Court to make arguments um, in this case. And CCLA argued that forced evictions uh, violate Section 7, Life, Liberty, and Security um, Charter Rights, and constitute a deprivation of life, liberty, and security of the person for encampment um, residents. We argued that as a basic human need, shelter is a building block to fully recognize and asserting rights, freedom, and dignity of those who are unhoused. CCLA became involved in this case because of the important equality aspect of protecting the rights of unhoused people. In December, the Ontario Court of Justice released a decision that was a partial victory. The bylaw was struck down as unconstitutional in relation to the prohibition of overnight sheltering. And in order to make the bylaw comply with the Constitution, the court restricted the bylaw's application to apply only to the daytime, so one hour after sunrise to one hour prior to sunset. On the other hand, the, um, the Kingston decision is a clear finding. On the one hand, the, the Kingston decision is a clear finding, another clear finding that the city bylaw prohibiting unhoused individuals from sheltering in municipal parks is unconstitutional. This echoes other encampment decisions, um, and the court found that creating shelter to protect oneself from the element is important to an individual's dignity and independence. This is an important reiteration of the status of unhoused individuals as rights holding members of the general public that are entitled to have this, this, the equal use and the same use of, um, of public spaces. 
However, there are problematic aspects of the decision as it relates to the imposition of a daytime ban on encampment. So the court held that it could not reach a conclusion on this issue of daytime sheltering because um, this was a factual issue and not um, a legal principle. However, the problem with this approach is that the court dismissed very important developments in encampment jurisprudence for British Columbia and Ontario, specifically in Waterloo, that had found that encampment residents' rights to shelter is not limited to overnight hours. So while this decision made a clear finding that the prohibition on overnight shelter is a constitutional violation, the court left open the possibility of prohibiting daytime sheltering could be a breach of Section 7 rights. So this does leave open the possibility of a challenge on the daytime ban, and the Kingston Community Legal Clinic is exploring this possibility in the wake of the city attempting to enforce a daytime ban. Um, there are also practical issues with keeping a, in place a daytime prohibition. So these problematic aspects of this decision is that a prohibition on camping in municipal parks comes into force one hour before, um, but sorry, one hour after sunrise, and only lifts one hour before sunset. So there's important practical issues with requiring encampment residents to pack up every day. Um, this includes the physical and psychological burden of carrying your belongings all day until the ban is lifted and not having a fixed home or community. What is important to note is that when the state interferes with an individual's ability to shelter themselves, the time of day doesn't dictate whether an individual's dignity and independence have been violated. And many of the implications of a Section 7 um, breach on overnight shelters applies to daytime sheltering as well. So after the Kingston decision was released, CCLA strongly urged the city of Kingston not to pursue further legal action to enforce a bylaw during the daytime that would cause harm to encampment residents. We hope that the city would work with encampment residents and their advocates in finding alternatives to ensure that the dignity and autonomy are respected of unhoused people. The CCLA continues to ad advocate that Section 7 charter rights of encampment residents should not be restricted to the act of sleeping or um, exclusively to overnight hours only. So CCLA has also been monitoring issues around encampment evictions in other jurisdictions, such as Edmonton, Halifax, and most recently in Cambridge, Ontario. So um, we are monitoring that issue, and there's um, especially as spring comes around, there will be um, more activity on encampment evictions um, to come. And this is an important issue that CCLA will um, continue to monitor and advocate on. So in conclusion, it's been a very busy year in the Equality Program, and this quarter we have been busy defending and protecting rights and freedoms of marginalized and vulnerable individuals and groups across Canada. So I provided you this afternoon with a snapshot of some key Equality Program issues and cases that we are advancing. I do have a few other quick program updates. So for example, um, I mentioned briefly the Montreal racial profiling case. And last October, I updated you on a precedenting setting challenge of police powers that enabled racial profiling in Montreal, in a case in Montreal. Um, the update is that the Court of Appeal hearing was held at the beginning of March, and we are now awaiting a decision on that case. So look out for um, our newsletter for updates on this case and for other communica further communications. Um, another update is that we've been granted intervener standing, standing in several new interventions in cases that will be heard in the courts this year. Um, one, I'll just briefly run through them because I do want to make time for questions. Um, so one is a challenge of COVID benefits that discriminate against workers with disabilities at the Court of Appeal of Ontario. Another is a challenge of the federal um, court, uh, federal uh, sorry, a challenge in the federal court of Canada of provisions of the Immigration Refugee Protection Act that allow the cessation of refugee protection uh, for refugees who are deemed to have reavailed themselves of the protection of their home country. We also recently intervened in a case before the Supreme Court of Canada on the jurisdiction of statutory bodies in order to order systemic remedies in a case of a vulnerable young person whose rights were violated while they were under the protection and care of the state. 
Um, and finally, a legal challenge of the prayer van in Quebec is also still pending. Our legal team is diligently preparing our case by obtaining expert reports to support our legal arguments about the negative harms such a prayer van will have on students. So CCLA is committed to fighting to advance equality rights for all of us in Canada, and especially the most um, marginalized and vulnerable groups in our society. And we could not do this work without the support um, of, of individuals like you who make it possible for us to engage in launching constitutional challenges, participating in interventions in the courts, contributing to law reform activities, and continuing to engage with the public to highlight the importance of protecting rights and freedom for equity-seeking groups. So I now look forward to answering any questions you may have and for a fruitful discussion. I will now pass it on to Michael, who will moderate these questions. So thank you, Hardy. So we have about 15 minutes left for questions. So I encourage you, um, if you haven't already, to please type your questions in the Q&A box. We'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so Hardy, the first question I have for you is, has any individual brought forward a human rights complaint in Quebec concerning Bill 21? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so to my knowledge, I don't know if there's been human rights complaints. Um, so there are other, um, so part of the Bill 21 challenge includes um, a number of petitioners and, and there was um, um, like a few cases that were heard together on it um, in the court. Um, to my knowledge, I don't, I'm not aware of um, the human rights system and if that has been used um, to try to challenge um, the impact of Bill 21 um, on on individuals affected. Right. And as a follow-up question to that, are there any other provinces where freedom of religion is being infringed upon in this way? Um, so not to this extent of, of this kind of wide sweeping um, policy legislation, but um, I mean, uh, religious freedoms are, you know, um, an issue um, like right across the country. Um, so there's, you know, instances around that we've seen in like, you know, Manitoba around like religious schooling and, um, you know, those kind of issues. We also have in Quebec, we have our prayer ban case uh, where the Quebec government has implemented um, a policy directive that prohibits like spaces in schools to be utilized for, for religious purposes, such as overt prayers um, that we are challenging as well. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously, there's other issues like in around um, provisions of healthcare services that impact like, you know, um, like that um, have religious elements to it in, in the sense that people um, are, are arguing that religious uh, rights and freedoms are um, being restricted. Um, for, you know, their ability to, um, like, you know, access um, certain um, healthcare, like, so that, sorry, so in, 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 in order to access um, um, abortion care in, like, religiously affiliated hospitals or healthcare settings, um, that's an issue that's also um, popped up in, in other jurisdictions um, in, in, in Canada as well. Okay. Um is there a way to follow the proceedings in April um, when the court will hear from the nine legal intervening parties um, regarding a seven, policy 713 in New Brunswick? Um, will it be in person? Can you go in person? Will it be online? Or will there be court transcriptions? Um, so yeah, so the, 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 the intervenors hearings in April in um, New Brunswick is um, an open court um, proceeding. So individuals, um, it's an open court, so they're able to um, attend in person. Um, I'm not sure, um, like, you know, I think the dates, like, uh, I don't know if we have the dates out to the public, uh, but they are like, you know, in, in mid um, April, and, you know, it's court, courts are open. So anybody that's interested is welcome to attend those um, open proceedings. I can and just, I just want to jump in and say that uh, Harney has done a tremendous job of also keeping our community and our public informed. So first of all, we've got an immense media interest. And so you'll certainly be hearing about it there. But if you come to our website, we have been posting, uh, not necessarily transcripts, but we're certainly posting updates and information about proceedings as they go on. And we'll continue to do that. 
And just to add to that, all of our application materials um, do get posted on the website. So you can see um, the arguments that we are raising and all those materials, we do post that on our website. So definitely get to see it from our end. Um, and I know a lot of the intervener groups, um, they will also post on their end as well. Perfect. Thank you, Hardy. Um, so the next question is, why are so many provinces rolling back rights for trans youth now? It doesn't seem like it's really been an issue until late last year. Yeah, absolutely. So we've definitely seen a rise in anti-trans sentiments. Um, so not just in Canada, but also globally. So the, earlier this year, um, sorry, last year um, in September, I participated in a global trans rights convening um, with um, a body called the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, or INCLO, which CCLA is a member of. And we gathered with um, global trans rights activists from, like, you know, um, north and north and south um, countries, and you know it's 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 a phenomenon that um, is not just affecting Canada, and there's been a rise in anti-trans sentiments um, globally. So, I think what we're also seeing is from the U.S. Um, we're seeing these organized um, global movements of anti-rights um, organizing efforts and mobilization that have used key issues such as. Um, trans rights and um, like, you know, um, immigrant, refugee, migra migrant rights as focal points to um, to garner um, their, their base and a basis of support um, to push forward um, restrictions of, of, of rights in general and to roll back rights and protections that impact not just these particular communities, but will eventually affect all of us. Um, as rights holding um, members of society. I think it's so true what you say, Hardy. And I would add as well that, you know, part of it is mobilization. What are the issues that stick and, and various issues are tested out. This is one that seems to be sticking and there's a, a narrative that seems to be working. The other piece of it, of course, is backlash that as, you know, if, if you went back to the 1950s or 1960s, it was very difficult to have, to, to know that, that um, to us LGBTQ, IA plus people were out there, but of course we know that there are lots of uh, gay and lesbian and, and bisexual people that, that existed then, trans people existed then too. With the increased visibility, there's an increased backlash and an attempt to suppress that kind of progressive movement for people just to have the right to be who they are and have basic equality and safety. Okay, thank you, Noah and Harney for that. Um, so the next question I have for you is, Will the government be able to get, delegate public health decision making and therefore personal health freedoms to WHO as expected in the WHO treaty? Um, so I'm not sure. I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I don't know if I have the the requisite like you know expertise and knowledge on like healthcare and like regulations and you know um like WHO is international so. I, I wouldn't know how to like, you know, tackle that, um, like an answer in a, in a coherent um, mm -hmm. expertise way. I don't know. Do you have anything to add on that question? No, I mean, I, I agree. CCLA's focus and mandate is in Canada. And because our courts find international law um, largely uninteresting and unpersuasive and really don't look to the international legal system, it's not work that we focus on here at CCLA unless there is a very specific or particular international decision that we think can give us leverage in Canadian courts to protect rights and freedoms here. Um, and then just to add to that, though, like a lot of our interventions do, like, you know, mention international legal instruments and, you know, those are important components of of arguments. Um, but as Noah said, like the, the courts are really uninterested in you know, international standards and um, international, um, like, you know, instruments. Perfect. Thank you. So the next question we have is, um, can you provide a bit more detail about the racial profiling case in Quebec and also how that might affect police powers and racial profiling in other provinces? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so CCLA is a conservatory intervener in the racial profiling challenge in Montreal. Um, so at the lower court, um, I did do a, a briefing of this in October. So I think there's recordings of them. So if you want a more fulsome picture than I can provide in this Q&A, you can also go to that um, briefing that I did in October. But just in a nutshell, um, you know, the, the lower court in 
in that case um, that we got last year in um, November um, was a very strong, I think it was November, I can't remember exactly, um, but that case was um, a precedenting landmark decision um, that really said that, you know, these kinds of, that um, police powers um, um, used in this way that enable racial profiling um, were unconstitutional. Um, and so our hope was that like, you know, this kind of decision, like that the, that the Attorney General of Quebec wouldn't appeal the decision, but they did appeal it to the Court of Appeal. And our legal team provided um, a strong case um, in a hearing just uh, earlier this month, uh, in March 6th and 5th, uh, that, you know, reiterated our, our, our points that um, the, you know, that the lower court was correct in their application of the of, of the law and um, moving, you know, um, progressively moving us forward um, on like, you know, the the issue of racial profiling um, as a constitutional violation um, and that it's, you know, um, substantive equality issue um, to, um, like, you know, that must be upheld um, this decision. So, um, that's where we're at, and we're waiting to hear a decision from that court, uh, the Court of Appeal decision, and you, we will be able to provide an update on that um, um, when we get the decision, so look out for that. And okay. there was the additional question of the impact in other provinces, Harney, and I know oh, that sorry. going to the Quebec Court of Appeal yeah. may have an impact, and certainly if it goes to the Supreme Court, can you explain? Yeah, that? sorry, I forgot to add on that point, but yeah, as Noah said, like, it, you know, I, I think our hope was that... Um, you know, if we get a positive decision at the Court of Appeal um, decision, that that will, you know, um, that, you know, that that will be the end of the story and that that decision will be um, a precedent setting decision that will help in other provinces as well. All right. So the next question we have is a bit of a long one. So bear with me. Um, considering many of the recent leg legislation banning trans and gender diverse children, and use their rights to choose their pro chosen names and pronouns, among other things, in schools are based on information and disinformation. Um, what can be done to educate conservative politicians on evidence-based truths regarding the social, legal, and medical needs of the trans and gender diverse communities? So that's a great question. Um, I think what really resonates is, you know, to really share stories of the impact and the harm that these policies are causing to to young people and their families, right? So um making sure that, you know, those who are in public officials that are in the decision making um chairs are um, making these types of policies, um, get a fulsome picture of of what the impact is of these policies and the harms caused. So for example, a lot of the harms um, are very real detrimental um, harms from being, you know, misgendered, um, like, you know, dead named. So dead naming means calling somebody from a name that they don't identify with, that they no longer identify with. Uh, misgendering is, you know, referring to somebody by their incorrect um, gender identity. Uh, so those are, those are, um, things that have lasting psychological and sometimes physical um, impacts on on individuals. So, um, you know, like just sharing those kind of stories and contributing to um, like, you know, public messaging on that, um, like talking to friends and families, um, signing petitions, uh, you know, um, writing letters to your elected officials contributing to this public discourse that um, amplifies um, the messages of trans and gender diverse students, um, that their rights matters and um, that they, you know, deserve to be included and safe and welcomed in, in society and public spaces. All right, thank you. So this one, I uh, was switching back to house, the issue of housing. Um, like this U.S. Supreme Court, the CCLA seems to be spending a lot of time naturally drilling through various codes, acts, and charters to further justice. Good so far. However, in some 10 cities, you can see the risk of violence, fires, addiction, and mental health issues. House avail housing availability is definitely an issue, but not the only issue. How does the CCLA deal with these complex issues? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, so I mean, like even like, you know, when we take on an issue, we look at it from multiple perspectives to see is this like, you know, a case, um, an issue that we can have an impact on advancing equality um, for my program equality and for other programs um, in their program areas. 
Um, and so there are complexities around um, encampments, um, safety and uh, for like, you know, for, um, you know, like gender and gender identity. And um, there's a lot of different complex issues. And we do take those into account um, when we are deciding how, what position and what arguments that we advance in these types of cases. Um, so in terms of like, you know, encampments, um, like the housing crisis and affordability crisis is a significant issue um, that like, you know, leads to, you know, um, um, more and more encampments. And we're gonna see this issue arising um, like, you know, more, like, you know, more prominently in the years to come. So it's definitely an issue that needs to be tackled, not just in the courts, but also through public policy. Um, so I forgot to mention that, and this was something I wanted to mention in my notes, um, my, or my speaking, but I did forget to mention this, but the federal housing advocate released a really comprehensive report on um, encampments and housing um, of, of unhoused people and, and the affordability, like, you know, affordable because and recommendations. And so we look at that as well as some of the recommendations from leading experts to help inform um, our perspective and the arguments that we put forward in these types of cases. I would add uh, to what Harney said, because we have these conversations internally. So it's wonderful that you're here and you're asking these questions and we have the opportunity for this dialogue. And just this week, we had a conversation about, you know, playground parks, as opposed to sort of big ravine spaces where people have set up tents. If people have nowhere to sleep and the choice is a sidewalk or an area of a ravine that doesn't have a playground and doesn't have children playing, what are our public spaces for? And and realistically, practically, pragmatically, what is what should we be doing for people who have nothing? And often those people, as you know, Harney has indicated, those people are often marginalized, not just through poverty, but because they are uh, racialized, newcomer, refugee, have mental health issues, and so on. And, and ideally, you know, we need a solution to the housing crisis, but from a rights perspective, to deny somebody the protection of a thin piece of nylon, to deny them the ability of company that, that they may want to keep to increase their protection and their safety on the streets. Uh, those those are critical issues, but but they are they do raise difficult questions, and we are constantly looking and evaluating, as Harney has indicated. So thank you, Harney and Noah, for all of this. Um, so it's almost two. So those are the last questions. So I'm apologize to everybody who didn't we didn't get to answer questions this time, but I'm sure I encourage you to come to our next uh, quality briefing and answer questions. Ask, ask your questions there. Um, so I'm just going to pass it over to Harney for a quick wrap up. And, Hey, so thank you for all these amazing questions and the discussion and your interest in um, the equality program and the work we are doing. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, for any more information of any of the cases I discussed or other issues that we're working on in the equality program or other areas of CCLA, um, please visit our website. And if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, you can sign up on our website to stay up to date. Um, thank you once again for um, attending and hearing uh, about the work I'm doing uh, and we're doing at CCLA in, in the equality program. Uh, Noah, do you have any uh, final remarks? I wanted to echo what you said, Harney. I wanted to thank you for an amazing presentation. Um, so glad that everybody got to hear about the incredible work and the important work that you're doing. And I wanted to thank each of you who came here, took an interest. Uh, your support, Your support for CCLA is critical, as you can see. And the equality program is just one sector of what we're doing. And together you are helping us work towards a vision that we share, a common vision for a better Canada that is more fair, more just, more equal. So thank you again. Perfect, and thank you and how are you, Noah. Um, so it's just about 2 p.m. So we're gonna end it here. Um, just a quick reminder, um, this was recorded. We will make the recording available shortly via email to you. If you've signed up, uh, you'll get the recording. Um, so we encourage you to come out to our next equality program briefing. Um, which will be in around three months. And really thank you all for coming today.